use that pencil, eye pencil, write in. I, I like I, here. I want to be like a clarinet. Here I want to be like the strings. Making it orchestral will 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 make this instrument less like a guitar and more like an orchestral, a, a multi-orchestral instrument. One that could. It's the best of all worlds. I think it's through timbre that we access the full potential of the guitar as an orchestral instrument. Um, and what do I mean when we talk about timbre? Timbre are the colors that we access from here as we go down this spectrum to the bridge. And we have, we have to define those terms. Um, and so I would like to call over here, Metallico. Then we have Suo Ponticello. Then we have Natural. Then we have Tasto over the neck and then Sul Tasto. So those are five tone colors, timbres, that we employ to give diversity of flavor, um, to really make our music process more vibrant. And I, I, I think it's, it's something that I see less and less of today. Um, which is a shame, I think. Um, it, it does add a layer of complexity because there is a choreography um, aspect to this. Choreography meaning, you know, dancers have choreographies moving from uh, point A to point B to point C. Same thing. It, it takes a lot to plan out how to get from over here to over here to over here to over here. And so, but... I think one is we have to map out what they are. We have to identify these colors. And if, if, if you know, some people, they have Sul Ponticello, they have uh, Natural, and they have Sul Tasso. That's three. I have five. I like to break it down a little bit further. I like the minutia and the nuance of colors. And in fact, I don't even think five does it justice, but I think I would probably drive ourselves crazy trying to identify uh, and define, you know, a hundred different colors. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but it's it's so powerful this this use of uh, timbre, and I I think when when playing music, I mean one of the things that I I, I think of is when something is repeated. For example. That was from. Uh, the, the Torina uh, Fantasia Seviana. Most people I, I, I hear, this is not everybody, but most people I hear go like this. I see, I, it's so ingrained a change, but. <laughs> and, you know, there is a uniformity and about that sound that's, that's really beautiful, but. One, you know, you're asking yourself, why, you know, when do I use different timbres and which ones do I use? So, um, in, let's say, dissecting this, this part of the Fantasia Seviana, this, this thematic material. Why, why would we use a different color, so to speak? And one of them is natural. The other one is, as I think you heard, is Sul Ponticello. Why? Why would we do that? Why when it's much easier just to stay right here? Because it gives more flavors. Anybody who has been to Spain, and I, I encourage all of you to visit Spain if you haven't. If not, go online. Look up the, the topography of Spain. Go to YouTube. Type in flamenco. T type in... Um, uh, you know, watch a, one of Manuel de Falla's uh, operas or ballets. Uh, w w you know, I, I think immersing yourself in the music of, of Spain, for example, will showcase such a diversity of timbres and colors that when playing the, the music of Spain on the guitar, 
it's required. Uh, it, it seems almost implied. But the score doesn't say that. Yeah. So when you, and, and this brings me back full circle to what we're talking about is being active interpreters. Take that pencil out, take that eye pencil out, whatever, and write in that score. Here, I want to play natural, N-A-T, period. Then the second time, write in sul ponticello. And the first time you could have written, it, it is possible, the first time you were like, natural, natural. But I would, I would write them in, map it out. That's, I do that all the time with colors because, you know, like, especially with an extensive work that's, you know, more than a page or two, it's hard to remember. It's like, oh, was I supposed to be sul tasto here or sul ponticello? Was I supposed to be um, natural? Sometimes it's hard to keep it all in order. So I think physically putting it on the paper and then like reviewing it and watching the score as you're going through it and then practicing slowly. Sul ponticello. And again, I chose to do the Roschetto there. Why did I do that? It could have been, or those are just, that's a choice I made. It may, it may not be the best one for you, or it may, it may in that Roschetto, you know, I think about like, what would Paco de Lucia uh, do there? Or, you know, or Paco Pena or any of the great Sabicus, what would they do in with a, a certain Roschetto? And, you know, it, it comes back, it, Classical music is so controlled. Everything that we're learning is, so, is trying to be, to control the minutiae, the details. But in this very instance, brass gatherers are sometimes erratic. Sometimes you'll miss a string. Sometimes it's not all the string. That's not, that's not the spirit of it. So I think this, these, these technical things are very much infused with um, the spirit of the music that you're playing, the culture, the people, uh, the composer, you know, read about if, if you know, take Torino for example. Read about him, where he grew up, what he where he was studying, who he was talking to, um, what influenced him, and and that's gonna that will inform you and give you a context, and it'll give you ammo for when somebody says, you know, you know, why the heck are you putting a, a tone color there? Or a timbre. Why? Why'd you go down to put the sulpon ponticello, and then you can be like, uh, well, you know, the, um, you know, this this specific uh, figure, Paco Lucia, when he's doing rasquiados, has this um, essence in his in the way he does it. Um, there's a certain erratic nature, spontaneity, uh, vibrance, colorful nature. Um, if you look at the topography of the country, you go from mountainous. Um, uh, regions, arid regions, uh, to very green and lush regions in the north. So it, 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 the the land was built for change, for subtlety. So so is the music, um, and and I, I think that music requires you at all points to to explore variety. I think that's that's what. That's what make, that turns me on about music in the interpretive process is the variety, not the, uh, the homogenous nature of it, not one hand position, but all of them and, um, and finding order, but then organically moving the finding the, the, the choreography should be natural. At first it'll be like, I've got to be so I've got to be natural. I've got to be sulta. It'll be you'll punch them out at first, and it'll seem um, inorganic, and then it'll it, you'll send you'll massage the choreography, and it and then it will again transcend the movements and 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 showcase subtlety and immersion and expressivity, which is ultimately what we want to create. Super, super um, interesting. And I think it's incredibly helpful to map those out because sometimes um, those those colors are, are conditional and depend on each other. Uh, for example, when you have a phrase which which starts like that and then you and then you intended to have a, a color change 
uh, in the repetition of the phrase, but you forgot like one change and suddenly you, you, you try to fall back into your plan and then you end up with being uh, like accidentally, accidentally having the same color on, on, uh, on, a, on a phrase totally. which you intended to be different. So mapping that out, that's, I think that's a huge point. It's, it's real, and it's fun too. I, and I think even more so than the mapping and, and being an active uh, participant in the interpreter process, I would, I would take yourself even further away from the instrument and, and imagine what the story is for that, that moment. This is where we can be, you can sort of pull out the inner child and discover the meaning for you. Like what it, like the scene, the opera scene or the, the play scene in that moment might be very idiosyncratic to your imagery and what you perceive to be the story uh, compared to somebody else. And that's the beauty of it. But I think sometimes it, it gets locked up there. And I, I think you should be, again, talk about it out loud. I ask my students all the time, like, what's the scene? Tell me. Or in a master class, I'm like, okay, that, that's great. Uh, what's going on? Um, and it, it can be the most absurd story, the most absurd scene, wearing the most obscene and crazy outlandish outfits. But again, when you're playing the music of Fernando Sor or Giuliani, they were listening to operas. And, and, and you know, unless you infuse the music of those, compos of those composers' music with colors, and, and, and variety, it, it's going to be boring and static and, and, and it will not transmit expressivity. So I think, I think you should push yourself to sort of open up that box, be a conductor. You know, even what I would recommend is look at the score and conduct the piece. Who can, even if you're not, a, if you don't know how to conduct, it doesn't matter. I think it's, um, Waving your arms within the, the more intense parts, oh, yeah, and then uh, a little bit less motion during the more subtle parts. Great, do that. That's fantastic. And I think what you'll find is that that activity, that motion, will positively impact the way that you play the piece. It, it, it reminds me of um, there was this uh, this teacher in graduate school. Uh, he was um, a conductor in. He still is a conductor. In, in Boston, and he would he would always always say you you need to consider one buttock playing, and I was like, what the heck does that mean? And literally, the mo movement of the body off one buttock and into the air, and then the other way, sort of swaying back and forth, it infused expression naturally. You know, it's, it, it's tough. We're, we're, we're guitarists and we're stuck here. We're like glued to the ground. And it's, it's hard to sort of move out of our seats and, and, and feel like we can move. But that isn't the case. If you, if you get into it, I think it'll again, I think the, 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 the physical nature of what you, know, you do with your body will infuse the music and the spirit that you, you capture. So I wouldn't be afraid of that. And again, this is your world. It's like you can really, I think, uh, and, and whether or not you see it or believe it, you're escaping to another world when you're on stage or when you're at home practicing by yourself. You are, you are transporting yourself somewhere else. And, uh, what, what, and what I think is one of the most important things is um, fully realizing all of those intangible things. Those uh, that that fantasy, that imagery, uh, giving yourself a context, sort of a springboard to be the most expressive possible. Not to be just a, you know rooted in the ground, a pillar. No, you're organic, moving, expressive, fun-loving, um, variety-filled player, it, charismatic. You know, and there's varying degrees of that, of course. You might have to bring out a very solemn, intimate, sad, nostalgic, but that, you know, we are that in that way, we are actors and actresses. Um, and, and, um, I, I, I encourage all of you come up with the scenes for your piece and, and use these timbres. 
Um, you know, in, in Renaissance music, we have medium range of timbres associated with multiple voices, and the, there's a sonority of vowels. Um, and taking that into con consideration with uh, timbre and Baroque music, we have large range associated with. If, if you haven't read the Doctrine of Affections, I would uh, really uh, encourage all of you to check that out. The fact that certain keys elicit a certain feeling, or um, it's it's really cool. Um, and then in the classical area, large range associated with imitation of instruments, which we were talking about. Like in one moment, you're selling like a strings, or in another moment, like the trumpet. Um, but uh, you need to identify. You can even write that in the score again. Use that pencil, eye pencil, write in. I, I like I, here. I want to be like a clarinet. Here, I want to be like the strings. Making it orchestral will 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 make this instrument less like a guitar and more like an orchestral, a, a multi-orchestral instrument. One that could, it's the best of all worlds. Um, and uh, in in the romantic area, you have a medium range of timbre choices that are set by the parameters of the phrase, and perhaps you don't change the timbre as much within the phrase. Um, and then in modern contemporary music, uh, I would refer to the score. Uh, I know, for example, uh, Roland Dienz, it's very particular about not only his dynamics and articulation, but his timbre, like what, what he wants. Sul, Sul Ponticello, Natural, Tasto, Metallico. Metallico is used actually in scores. You will see M-E-T. Um, and I, I, it's vast. It's it's really. I, you might be like, oh my gosh. Well, I, you know, I've got all, I've got these five timbres, and how do I use them? I, again, we are scientists, explorers, adventurers. Um, I would say, get into the score and just try. If it fails, who cares? Try again. Again, this is you know they, we're, we're the, the cool thing about the guitar, for better or for worse is that it's it's a solo sport so you're by yourself when you're trying these new things out and um you know I'm, I'm, and you have great teachers and 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 mentors around to encourage you and and i'm sure that uh there are other lessons in tone base i know for a fact there are that are a that follow along these same lines perhaps there's a particular piece and you can look at what one artist suggests in terms of tone colors and timbre for a certain piece and, and so forth. But I, 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 I hope that this uh, lecture, whatever you call it, conversation piece, was an access point to expression to the poetry of the guitar through the pillars that we talked about at the beginning and then um, being more active listeners, participants in the interpretation process, and then moving on to vibrato, which is so core. I, I would, when you're done with this, this lesson class conversation, take your guitar, practice going up and down the neck slowly. Just feel at ease with moving your arm in a lateral motion. It's sort of like with dancing. Many times they start with just like helping loosen up your hips. And I find that to be the hardest part. When yeah. dancing, I, I am no dancer, but that's like one of the things they're like, man, your hips are really stiff. So just getting it moving was enough to get the sort of the dancing groove going. So it's the same thing here with vibrato. Oh, yeah. Fantastic, man. Adam, th this has been so thorough, so inspiring and so dense, man. A amazing. <laughs> we, we could have just recorded that and, and released another video of that. Fantastic. <laughs> I loved it. Thank you so much, Martin. Or the more it's an ergonomics thing. I mean, yeah. you might find. I mean, go for it. if you can find. If it's more comfortable to start right to left, that's fine. I don't think there's as long as it's even, and it's appropriate um, for the given moment that you want to express. I, 